The fact of evil, the difficulty of virtue, the fickleness of the human heart. These three things are making this Holy Week journey with us. God's story embraces ours, we said on Palm Sunday. But yesterday we were made to ask ourselves, do we stick to the path virtue demands, like Mary of Bethany? Or are we tempted to stray like Judas, giving in to self-importance and pride, putting human ways before God's. Fickleness. Fickleness stirs puddles of doubt in our minds. But like those Greeks who came to Philip and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. We are drawn to the mystery of him. John doesn't tell us anything about these Greeks or whether they got to see Jesus or not. We could speculate, but it, well, maybe it doesn't matter. Whoever they were, they were curious about the sensation that Jesus was causing, so they wanted to see him. Curiosity doubt and faith jostled for dominance in their minds and they had questions they wanted answered. So do we. I remember when that struggle between doubt and faith struck me. I was 16. And you know what being 16 is like. The heart of the tempestuous who am I teenage years. Emotions crashing around. Romantic notions of this and that always in the wings ready to gush out as joy or tears. Literature and poetry were my thing, not religion not faith. And then out of the blue, one of the poets invaded my life with words that have never left me. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the mist of tears, I hid from him. And under running laughter. I heard those words and I burst into tears. Bewildered. Who was this him with a capital H? this pursuer? And why should I have felt so radically shattered? Of course, I, I realized that him with a capital H was the God in whom I didn't believe. Literature had told me that. But I was content with faithlessness, with atheism, I'd even taken delight in mocking a devout Baptist girl in my class, reducing her to tears. It made me feel smart and clever and funny. Now the poet's words, or this pursuer, left me shocked, bereft. Bereft of what? Questions followed me around like persistent flies, but it was 16 years before I stopped fleeing and I sought answers. Who was this God? Was this, 
Was this Jesus of whom people spoke? And what would accepting him with a capital H mean for my life? Like those Greeks, I wanted answers or explanations or possibilities credible enough to survive alongside the doubts. Something to allow faith to stand on its own feet. I wanted, I wanted the smell of black and white truth. Truth about God, yes. Truth about myself, yes. But also truth about a bigger world beyond me. Somehow I knew the two mattered to each other, that there's more to life than each of us as individuals, that holding ourselves aloof from each other is a kind of betrayal. Ridiculing that unfortunate Baptist girl, for example, was not just unkind and cruel and rude. It was a betrayal of responsibility to her as part of that bigger world. Betrayal is such an ugly thing. Oh, I, I, I don't mean the times when we have been betrayed. Any of us who has been betrayed knows what that feels like. But to drag out those moments during this week seems to me a kind of personal indulgence, an evasion, closing one's eyes to the bigger picture, the bigger world. Holy Week of all times in the Christian year is when we must speak of betrayal and what actions in our lives have been betrayals of our faith, our responsibility to each other in the eyes of God. Of course, a talk of betrayal turns every mind to Judas. But I really wonder whether racing to bag him out isn't simply too easy. Oh, for 2,000 odd years, everyone has focused on Judas as the quintessential bad guy. And maybe he was a really nasty piece of work. Or maybe just a poor soul who was clever who clever by half, who misjudged his friend Jesus and the politics of their world, thinking he could manipulate both. He couldn't. Jesus didn't buy Judas's goal of trouncing the Romans, so Judas played the last card in the pack. Betrayal. And he lost. Jesus died, and so did Judas, the one ultimately in glory, the other in miserable ignominy. God's story embraces ours, we say. Judas forgot that. He forgot it in passion for his own story, his own goals. He betrayed Jesus and lost. Peter betrayed Jesus too by denying he knew him, though Peter learned his lesson in the end. The other disciples abandoned Jesus on the cross and ran away. Disloyalty, betrayal, fickleness, Probably Peter and the disciples didn't mean to betray Jesus, but they did. If we are not to be fickle 
and betray like them. We need to remember the bigger picture and Jesus' words. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. But here we have a difficulty. Those poetically attractive but slightly remote words cannot be separated from other less comfortable words from Jesus. If anyone want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. It's a challenge. And Luke rubs it in. Take up your cross daily, he says. Now, it's very tempting here to start dithering, dithering between faith and doubt. If we stick with faith, we'll be challenged to be sacrificial with our lives, to serve and love others, to think more of their needs than of our, our own. If we stick with doubt about the very existence of God, him or her with a capital H, we can do as we wish. Forget the tough stuff. Silence any niggling questions and, and forget all about those Greeks who wanted to see Jesus and forget all about our own questions. Game, set and match to doubt. It's so very easy to avoid the challenge of faith and hide behind doubt. We do it all the time, especially when a, a problem is far away and not of our own particular life or surroundings. And here I want to read you a piece about a problem that, that may not be a part of your lives or mine, but it is an ongoing and painful issue for both our countries. The sad business of refugees and asylum seekers. This piece is from a book called American Dirt. The central character, Lydia, is preparing a meal. And while she works, she's listening to news about migrant caravans coming to the US from Guatemala and Honduras. She hears about mothers pushing strollers thousands of miles, small children, walking holes into the bottoms of their pink crocs. Hundreds of families banding together for safety, coming all the way to El Norte to plead for asylum. Lydia chopped onions and cilantro in her kitchen while she listened to their histories. They fled violence and poverty gangs more powerful than their governments. She listened to their fear and determination, how resolved they were to reach Estados Unidos or die on the road, because staying at home meant their odds of survival were even worse. Lydia felt a pang of emotion for them as she tossed vegetables into hot oil. That pang Lydia felt had many parts. <clears throat> Anger at the injustice, worry, compassion, helplessness. But in truth, it was a small feeling. And when she realized she was out of garlic, the pang was subsumed by domestic irritation. despite her genuine compassion and concern. 
the demands of Lydia's faith were lost in a moment of immediate domestic concern. It happens to us all. It's so understandable and so confrontingly human. The fickle human heart pulls away from virtue and we hardly notice. Well, not for long, until the moment is past. Because we as individuals can't alone solve such a massive tragedy as a world where millions of refugees and asylum seekers prefer to face death in the hope of living. Helplessness silences us. But in our own individual lives and worlds, again, I wonder, how might we, like Judas and Peter and the other disciples, how might we betray our God, our families, our friends, our very selves? How often do we succumb to helplessness and the easiness of doubt rather than squaring our shoulders before the challenge of faith, standing firm and saying like those Greeks, we wish to see Jesus. How often do we hide behind the prophet Amos's words pleading, oh Lord God, cease, we beg you. How can we stand? We are so small. It will always be like this, flawed as we humans are. It is why Jesus' words challenge when he says to us, whoever serves me must follow me. It's why we need to repeat at every Eucharist, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. It is why, as Luke said, we are to take up our crosses daily. It is why, when daily, we say, I believe. We must also say, Holy God, Holy and Mighty, Holy Immortal One, help us in our unbelief.